conversation. Um, so the conversation around ADAPT, I do have a presentation in order to go through. I'm going to bring up a few of those slides uh, off here, but the, the the first thing that I want to do when we get into it is is address this uh, studio instance. So let me pull up the the very quick little overview, just so we have a basis in order to work off of. Uh, Okay, <laughs> so we knew for a very long time ago, uh, almost near the very beginning of the LibreText project or the then the Ken Wiki, that we wanted to have a homework system. And we wanted to have a homework system for a variety of reasons, and not just be available to have this ancillary uh, technology in order to augment uh, our needs as an instructor, uh, but to also be able to have control over it in order to be able to use it in a variety of different ways. And we were unable, and more importantly, to do it in a uh, as free as possible or low cost as possible uh, that we can get out there. So uh, we tried a variety of different technologies out there. Uh, and ultimately, we just basically decided that we needed to build our own uh, infrastructure that gave us the power to do the sort of things that we wanted to do. But, you know, to go back to uh, the mission statement that I presented yesterday, and where we're implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Those three C's uh, apply not only to the textbooks, but also to the homework system that we have uh, built in place. Uh, skip over that thing. Uh, <clears throat> let me, uh, let me, I'm going to skip, actually, let me get into the, the gritty details because we're I'm a little bit behind on my, my schedule. So ADAPT is the R term for the homework system that's meant in order to provide assessments, either formatively or summatively, either connected to a grade book or unconnected to a grade book uh, uh, <clears throat> in a variety of different modalities. Uh, ADAPT, just like the Libreverse that we've gone over so far, is exceedingly powerful technology. Uh, um, and part of the problems uh, with power is complexity. We're going through ways in order to try to simplify that uh, <clears throat> with the textbooks, and we're doing the same thing with ADAPT. So ADAPT is only two years old, but we're very excited about where we're going and also or where we've been and where we're going. Uh, so let's talk about some of the features associated with ADAPT, what characterizes ADAPT. So the first one in order to say is that ADAPT is built for multimodal use. So uh, it can be used for auto-graded questioning or for open-ended questioning. So the intent, getting back to that comprehensive aspect in uh, the, um, the statement that I, sh I gave before, we recognize that there are classes where there is no sufficient auto-graded capabilities in order to answer the assessments, period. So when I teach my quantum mechanics class I talked about before, the vast majority of the questions I ask my students are open-ended questions, uh, not mathematical questions that they can just submit a number that's five or whatever in order to evaluate. I need to see their thinking and their process in order to be able to do it. So we have an infrastructure set up in order to be able to facilitate open-ended questioning <clears throat> and then similarly open-ended grading of those questions that can handle responses that may be rich text or plain text. That is, if you have that full editing bar, or it's just basically text that you write down. You can submit audio, which is useful for foreign languages uh, <clears throat> um, or music. Uh, uh, or you can submit files if you want to be able to upload a PDF or drawings or Excel or, uh, in some cases, even Jupyter Notebook uh, uh, instances. The auto-graded technology is the ancillary stuff is to use existing technologies in order to be able to evaluate the submissions of the students without requiring human intervention or TA intervention, uh, in my case. <laughs> so there are different technologies out there in order to be able to facilitate that. And the technologies have their strengths and their limitations. And instead of trying to take a specific technology and push it far beyond its scope, uh, our approach is to say, well, let's take multiple technologies and use those technologies to address what they're well suited for and then build other technologies in order to be able to augment uh, those technologies as necessary. So the, what we did is that we integrated two existing technologies that are open source 
actually they're all open source, uh, that uh, were out there for the math um, communities. Uh, <clears throat> they were well suited for auto grading uh, capabilities um, and they had lots of power. So one is WebWork, which is one of the earliest homework systems uh, online. It came out back in, in 2000, sorry, 1995, 96, back when people considered the web uh, as a, a, a very fancy term in order to throw around across the board. And then IMath AS, which is the technology that underlies my open math and all the uh, Lumen um, for-profit uh, um, system. We have then H5P, which is this repository of uh, easy assessments that people can go in and build for it. That's where the studio is our repository in order to maintain that. And then we have native technologies that... Uh, right now are based off a of QTI, question and test interoperability. That's the technology or specifically the protocol that's used in learning management systems. Um, so if you have questions in Canvas, you can embed them directly into uh, ADAPT. And the key point here is to use the technologies for what they're suited for, but more importantly, each of these technologies doesn't play well with another technology. And there are lots of content in web work questions out there, a lot of IMath AS questions, a lot of QTI questions, and go through Canvas comments, lots of uh, question banks, and H5P. Uh, and instead of taking one and then ignoring everything else, we bring them all together into a central repository and use them in the same interface so that you don't have to worry about the details associated with one versus the other. And more importantly, if you're an instructor, you can tap into the repository of each of these things and mix and match them as necessary to address your goals. And that's one of the key components that we have here. And we're going to be expanding this. Like I mentioned to you, we received this $4 million investment from the state of California. That's going to be rapidly expanding the capabilities of our native uh, technologies that's out there. Um, so ADAPT is also built for multimodal use in terms of application. So how do you actually go about using that? Well, the, the first one is that you can go directly to the ADAPT website and students can do that as one of their actually most popular interface to using uh, ADAPT. You can embed ADAPT into your textbook. So your textbook then becomes a homework system itself. And, and nothing gets the students more engaged with the activity uh, or if it's engaged with the content of the book like actually having the, the homework that they need to solve right next to the content of the book that they are involved in. Now, there are very few studies in order to talk about the efficacy or the benefit of embedding questions into books versus embedding questions or not embedding them, keeping them separate. Um, but I do at least believe that that's a, a better approach in order to do these uh, things. Alternatively, and we'll be releasing this uh, very soon, is that we have an ADAPT uh, application, in fact, two applications, one for iPhone and one for uh, Android that students can then use as a direct interface. That's useful, for example, when you're uploading images or PDFs, you can just take a screenshot and it automatically dumps into our system. But more interesting, or at least more important, is that then this um, phone app can act as an in-class clicker system. So now you have ADAPT that you could go into your classes and interact with your students without having to pay for an eye clicker or some other technology in order to be able to facilitate that. That does fold into the infrastructure that we have in place. And I teach large classes, like 500 student classes. This is the only way that I can interact with them uh, in any way whatsoever. Well, I can chat with them, but I only get the front row. And lastly, you can embed ADAPT directly into your learning management system. You can do grade pass back to uh, your LMS, and you can use that as the grade book instead of using the, uh, the ADAPT homework system. It's very flexible in the way that you can go about using it, in part because we have control over it from top to bottom. Uh, there are two types of ways in which we uh, deliver questions right now. <clears throat> uh, and when you go to the website, one is a traditional way. Uh, which lets you build courses. In courses, you make assignments. In assignments, you have questions, and you assign the assignments at certain dates and times to be open and closed, and students go through the questions and they complete them. <clears throat> and that's the conventional way in which you, you do this, and this is really quite fine uh, it, way in order to do that. ADAPT is called ADAPT because it has some adaptive learning capabilities. Now, we're not focusing aggressively on that right now, but the adaptive learning capabilities that we do have is focused around what's called learning 
trees or decision trees, if you're familiar with that, uh, that parlance. And the idea behind it is that you can start to make connections between different nodes in a tree that consists of questions or expositions, descriptions behind certain concepts, such that when students uh, fail uh, or don't get right the root question on a node, I'm sorry, on a tree, they then have the ability to go into the tree in order to learn components necessary in order to master the question up here. Uh, another way in order to say that, <clears throat> and this is not the best tree in order to do that, is a student comes in, they then uh, have a question, they get the question, the question is decided via auto grading to not be correct, and then what we do is we provide them a redo, a do-over, if they can actually demonstrate some proficiency in one of the sub-skills necessary in order to master that question. And we let the students, not an algorithm, but we let the students decide about what skill they want to actually uh, learn go over and demonstrate proficiency in order to be able to uh, get that do over. Uh, and then uh, they, they get back to it. And, and the reason that we prefer this over an algorithm that spoon feeds this to the students is that we want to be able to develop some level of agency in the students. We want them to be able to be engaged in their activity instead of just basically being a passive component in their learning. Uh, we also want them to develop metacognition uh, in order to identify what they know and don't know uh, and basically being able to uh, to do this actively is the way in order to go about doing it instead of having an algorithm spoon feed it uh, into them. And that's the reason why we haven't pursued uh, the algorithm. When we got, talk about algorithms, which we will, uh, we're not going to talk about it. When we build algorithms uh, to do these things, they will be just signposts, recommendations, but we're never going to force students in order to do exactly what we think they are uh, able to do um, off of it. So, uh, I'm going to skip over these technologies uh, and kind of pull pull this all together into this uh, flow chart in terms of how we use these things. So we have a range of different types of questions, whether they're web work based or IMATH-IS or H5P or QTI native or open ended in a variety of ways, uh, and they can be combined together into the DAPT homework system. You can embed them into your textbook either formatively or summatively. Uh, uh, you can go directly to your learning management system via real-time LTI. Uh, you can do what's called delayed grading, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, your textbook can also couple directly into your learning management system so that you can make it so that students never even know that uh, ADAPT exists. Uh, and we have that. Uh, and they just basically read their book uh, on LibreText, or you can embed the book with the questions into your learning management system. Uh, I'm not really fond of that because I think it's clunky with all the details associated with LMSs and it's just disturbing. I mean, it disturbs me when I try to read it. But nonetheless, many people do prefer to uh, to present their, their results off of that. Okay, so that's a general overview of these things. So let's go into ADAPT and then I'm going to transition back to uh, Studio. <coughs> um, I, I mentioned this in the homework several times. I want to ask this again. Does everyone have an ADAPT account? Does anyone have an issue with uh, accessing ADAPT right now? Uh, Deborah, are you saying that you do or you, you can or you cannot access it? I can access it. I just can't log in. Did you get an access code? Yeah, LibreFest 21 or what, 2021. That's yeah. for the studio. Um, did you get an access code um, yesterday morning? Oh, probably. Let me go look. Uh, if you paste your uh, email address here, uh, I, I can quickly make one for you. With anyone else, if you if you don't have access to ADAPT, please uh, paste your email address into the chat or DM me your email address, and then I will um, uh, I will paste it. I will give you an access code in order to register. Okay, Lee, you already have an account, uh, so you may just have to access your your password. Uh, Deborah, you also already have an account. You just have to uh, reset your password. Okay, Brian, I just sent you an access code in order to create uh, an account, an instructor account. So we're particularly aggressive in terms of uh, limiting access to uh, ADAPT, in part because the integrity of the question database is important for its use. So if it gets violated, i.e. if it shows up on 
Chegg or Course Hero or something like that, then it starts to become less useful um, uh, as a homework system for everybody. So uh, we are very particular about having uh, giving access out to it. Uh, Deborah and Lee, uh, are if you're are you unable to are you able to access or re reset your password? I actually have limited control over that, to be honest. Okay. It should work because it says that you already have an account. Um, so there's, uh, we don't need to set it. Okay, Lee came in. I'm going to assume Deborah came in there and Brian is setting up and that everybody else has access to your account. Now, this right here is the front the face, which is basically the courses section for myself. Uh, which I've been using ADAPT for two years. So that means I have a lot of courses uh, that are in place here and that have been put together in a variety of different uh, roles that are there. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there are there are actually five types of accounts um, and three really only matter uh, uh, to you guys. One's an instructor-like account, which gives you the ability to build courses and assignments. One is a student. Uh, which doesn't give you the ability to build courses and assignments. They're just basically able to respond to questions that are available. And the third one uh, is a grader. So if you're at a R1 institution with TAs, uh, you're able to assign a grader that can't build things, but can actually start to assign grades. Uh, and that's especially useful for open-ended uh, assignments, um, less so for uh, auto-graded. The two other components that we didn't say, one is for developers that have access to lots of questions. And the last one is uh, for test uh, banks, uh, sorry, testing uh, uh, centers uh, that they can actually use ADAPT uh, in their their center uh, by opening up pre-made exams for assessments and things like that. So anyways, um, so the intent is this. Instructors require permission before they can get an access code to, uh, to put into here. Students can actually register for free. Uh, for free means no limitations uh, involved in it. However, for them to access any course, they need an access code for the course. So once you create a course, you can generate an access code that you give to your students. Uh, and that's the only way that they can see your course. So let's get into the, the lowdown here. Please ignore all these, these things here. You're going to come in and it's going to be blank, which is perfectly fine. So how does it work? Again, we have courses. Courses have assignments. Assignments have questions. So it's a terminology, this three-level structure. The complication in ADAPT is essentially saying, what's the nature of the assignments? What's the nature of the course? Sorry, the, the nature of the question. The, the courses are all relatively straightforward. So let's just go over making a new course. You just press a course up to here, uh, and it introduces this modal. Most of these questions are pretty straightforward in order to do, <coughs> including the course that we have here, the course number. They call this Chem 101, How I Learned to love the cats. Uh, public discussion, uh, and then these modals I'll describe, this is what students will see when they actually register this class. And please uh, follow along or create a course with me. This class uh, is about cats, quantum cats. Private discussion are sort of notes that I can keep internal or other instructors can see this faculty or students never see them. So like, I really hate this class. <laughs> Whatever you want. Uh, uh, there are your annotations uh, around this class, or you can say, you know, use this class in this way. You can have a syllabus like thing in order to give some guidance to other people on how to do these things. If you have a textbook URL, uh, you can actually paste that into there. Uh, if you want, for example, uh, let's say I want to grab one here. So since Charity is here, I'm going to grab her book. Here we go. So I can paste it in there. Uh, and that just provides a convenient mechanism for people to be able to find the book that's connected to their homework. Section, if you have one section for your class, you can just main or whatever. If you have multiple sections, like for example, I when I teach these 500 student classes, I have 16 sections connected to uh, the class and then I need to be able to organize uh, them uh, accordingly. Um, the uh, 
the, the CRN number, the course registration number, that's connected to the nature of the course on your class. That doesn't have to be anything real. And that's just meant for your own reference sake uh, for things. The term, um, I'm going to make this summer, uh, I think it's summer 22. Again, that's not meant for anything other than meta tags. I can give the start date and the end date of the uh, course. Um, that's important. Uh, at least the end date is important because after the end date is over, we start a, a countdown in terms of when we will preserve the data that the students have submitted, and then we wipe the data clean. So we don't want to actually sit on data on our side. We'll give you warnings about that. You can don't download the data to your own hard drive, but we just don't want to, uh, to hold on to this stuff because it's radioactive for a variety of reasons. Um, you can decide if you want the course to be public, which means you want other instructors to be able to find your course, uh, or private, which means you don't want anyone to find your course. Uh, uh, you can decide if it's anonymous. That means that you can make it so you can give a URL so other people can see the questions in your course, but they won't see the answers. And they, if it's auto graded, they won't be able to submit uh, numbers. So it's a simplified way of saying this is my course and the breakdown of my course and take a look at it. Alpha is like um, is like transclusion. So remember when we were talking about transclusion, we had a source page and we had a page that was transcluded to it. The same thing happens with here. You can make a, a source uh, course and another course that is connected to it. Now, in the old days, we would call it master slave, but that terminology we don't want to use these days. So we call them alpha beta uh, and we call it tethering. And this is convenient that if you have a uh, a lot of adjuncts teaching a specific class, you can actually create a primary course uh, and then all the adjuncts can, can teach secondary courses and then you can update the primary course and everybody can benefit from it in the same way that transclusion benefits uh, uh, for um, curation efforts. Now, and that's also useful when you embed questions into a book. You don't want to update the book every term because you just use the alpha course and, and there it goes. And then if you have your if you're connected to your learning management system on your campus or for pass back on LTI, um, you can it will tell you whether you confirmed it off of there. Uh, if your campus at the top here is indeed uh, available. So I'm going to save that. And now I made a course. So I'm going to presume that everybody has made a course. Meredith use in mind says page not found. I'm not sure in what context. Yeah, it says I'm logged in. And if I click on my courses, it says page not page not found, go home. If I click go home, it takes me to the adapt commons. Um, can you show me your screen? Yeah, let me um, screen share. That one. Okay, so where was it? Okay, uh, so uh, right underneath the logo, it says my course. My courses. Yeah, it's like grayed out. It won't let me click on it. Um, that is uh, weird. You had an access, you used the access code that we created? Uh, I set or, it up yesterday, yes. Using the access code. So you, it's not a student account. It shouldn't um, be, no. Hold on a second here. Um, I've never seen this before. Uh, so I'm a, uh, I'm a little perplexed off of here. Um, I'm good at breaking all your things, apparently. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, let me see here. Uh, M-E-R-E. -E. M E. There I am. Meredith too many. Not that one. Uh, too many. That one. Oh, well, there's two. I don't know why there's two. You have I'm not sure. I don't know why I have two. Okay, it looks like one you have partial registration, and the other one uh, you um, 
you didn't do that. Let me let me see what happens if I. Uh, um, uh, can you put your password in the uh, your e email address, not your password, in the chat? I'm just going to see if I can process this. Uh, this partial registration. Uh, I, I, I think one, you, you started it and then it didn't end. And then uh, we started again. And I need to talk to the programmer to find out what, what happened. Um, oh, access code. Um, can you try a Okay, you only have one. No, I only have one. And you should be able to uh, log in. At least I'm logging in as you right now. Um, uh, so if you try it, you should be able to get in, hopefully. So I'm going to continue this. I'm just going to do it uh, okay. with, Thank you. with you, uh, uh, with your account. Uh, so if you're so let's, you're in Centralia. It's a lot of centrals here. Um, where's Centralia? Am I spelling? Okay, so when I go to the login page, there's an SSO button or there's the email and password thing. Yeah, use the email and password thing. Okay, well, I just <laughs> I just clicked the SSO, and I think that's how it's like partially making and, and, a. And did it did it work? Did you get in? I, it didn't get in. It like goes. It asked me to pick my um, my time zone and things like that. So yeah, that's trying to uh, so Can you try the local login? Yeah. Okay, so course name uh, at Chem One Hundred and One, um, public law. Uh, private, this is optional, this is optional, this is not optional, uh, CRN is not optional, the term, I'm just going to call it an A, um, and then I'm going to save. It's, it's going to ask for dates because I didn't give it the right date, and now we've created a course uh, in Meredith's uh, account, so we can obviously easily delete that. So. Hopefully, Meredith, you're able to follow through. If not, we'll have the recording and we can take a much closer look at this and find out uh, what happened and more importantly, fix it so this doesn't happen again. Okay, so we made a course, but uh, uh, before we go in the course, I just want to show uh, what we have here. Um, here's the title of the course. This right here tells you whether it's shown, the term, and the actions. The shown is essentially a circuit breaker. It's, it's one way in order to turn it off, and it doesn't matter if people are students are registered for the class, uh, no one can see it. Uh, and so it's my quick way in order to just turn off uh, this thing. If you're in Canvas, I think they call it publish or not publish uh, the, the respective course. It's just a, a, a default button, and you can click it on it, and now it's doing it. So it's basically giving you a warning. You're about to unhide this course. You understand. And now it's it's available. Um, and th there you go. Um, now let's go to, uh, and then you have some editing. This right here will go to the grade book uh, for the, the course. Uh, it's No students are available. Um, this right here gives you the properties, which has the modal and a few additional things here that are connected to it. That's beyond what you had actually done there. Um, uh, you have the ability to copy the course, which will also copy uh, the uh, contents of the course, the assignments, if we actually create it. I can then delete it if I want. And just to make sure that you don't accidentally delete it, you need to paste the actual name of the course that you are de deleting. That's the new course. If you want to import an existing course, if you find someone that you actually particularly like, uh, like let's say you look at me and you say, I really like uh, uh, Delmar's uh, uh, 2C lab. 
I can click on that and I can import the entire uh, course uh, into my class into my section and I can see, okay, here are all the labs and the pre-labs and the quizzes and everything connected with uh, that course. So it's convenient in order to share courses because sharing is caring, the, the central approach for uh, central mission of, uh, of OER. So anyways, uh, I will mention that uh, when you copy courses, you don't ever copy student submissions. That's, that's all sacrosanct, uh, very protected. It's not meant to be distributed outside of your own uh, scope of work. Um, so let's go into this blank course that we created here. Uh, now I want to add an assignment. Now, yes, I can actually import an assignment from somewhere else, um, but right now I want to make a new assignment. And you have a modal that doesn't look terribly dissimilar to the, um, the uh, modal for creating the course. So you have an assignment name, assignment one. You can have a description, blah, uh, meh, uh, for private. Now, <clears throat> because this is a, uh, we have a range, this is connected to a grade book, then we have a range of different groups, classifications, or so that may be connected to it, because we're going to be connecting this to a rubric and evaluations and math. I can make this homework, which is what I care about. I'm going to make this internal. Uh, the reason that this is internal, uh, the reason the source could be external. So if you have something that's external to adapt that you want to submit scores in, like with a CSV file, you can do that. An example of that for uh, would be like uh, attendance for a class. Well, adapt's not going to be able to determine attendance, but you want to bring in the scores directly into adapt, uh, which you may want to do. Uh, was there something there, Deborah? No, okay. Um, so you oh, can. Oh, was my dog? Sorry. No, no, that's right. Um, so uh, you can internal is what we're going to be dealing with. You can decide uh, what type of rubric you want to use to grade. You can grade on performance, uh, or you can grade on completion. Uh, I, I'm probably going to change this a little bit in the near future in order to have more of the ungrading uh, modes out there or spec grading because I want to see it in action. Uh, and see how much I like it. Uh, I, I think there's a lot there, but I still haven't been 100% swayed by it because I want to actually test it out. So I'm going to make it performance, which is the more traditional way of doing things. Um, I can decide if I want to give points per question, absolute, or points per assignment, and then it distributes those evenly for all the questions in the assignment. So if I have 10 questions for the assignment and the assignment has 10 points, each question gets one point. If I have 11 questions in, uh, uh, for that assignment, but the assignment has 10 points, then each question is 0 0.9 points per question. And you can decide what you want to do about that. Um, Veronica, what if you want to grade according to a rubric? Um, I'm not entirely sure which rubric you may be asking about. There, there, so I mentioned uh, that once you get the scores, you can start to assign those to uh, grades and things like that if you want if that's what you're talking about uh no i create my own rubrics i'm looking for specific things in an assignment uh for example if i have to do an annotated bibliography i need a source for yeah yeah social so, problems so that, that right there that's that's open integrating and then you can you can make your own rubric uh, in there uh, that would still okay. be that would still be performance you're basically evaluating uh, the opposite is complete uh, is completion that, you know, if they just submitted it, they got 100% points uh, type of thing. Okay. Uh, so it, you have you have full ability in order to decide the rubric. We're going to probably expand that a little bit um, than what we have, uh, but I'll show you the, the, the speed grader, basically, in order to be able to do that. Okay, so you have defaults for number of points when you add them in. Now comes the complexity. Uh, you can decide your questions may be real-time grading, which means that the student submits the answer, if it's an auto graded technology, it will then give you uh, give the student the the solution back after they've submitted it so many times. So in other words, they can use this more as a formative learning experience where they want to get the responses of what they're doing in order to be able to move forward. Okay. The alternative is a delayed grading where they submit the score and they don't get feedback on it until you decide it's time for them to release the scores. So that's more used as a as a summative evaluation rather than a formative learning experience. But you have the choice in order to decide how you want to go about doing it. Uh, 
The two other choices are learning trees, which I mentioned before. I'm not going to have time to go into this, um, but I'll be discussing it in more detail um, uh, later on outside of this workshop. Uh, and the last one are clickers, because the way clickers operate, you're basically opening up a question at a specific time and closing it at a specific time and giving feedback. It's fundamentally a different type of technology in order to deliver the question than in uh, than, than these other homework assignments, which open at a certain date and end at a certain date and time and close at a certain date and time. Um, so you can decide how many times you're allowed the students in order to um, submit scores yeah, which may fit in the way that you actually want to do this you can decide if you have a hint for your problem if the students want to view that hint you can get them let them do that you can decide if you want the solutions if you create solutions and i'll show you how problems are organized in a moment um, that they can get them automatic or manual manuals when you decide you want to open the solutions up for all the students in the class and that's how I tend to do it. So I tend to have students uh, tend to have uh, questions as delayed. And then uh, after they've submitted them, after a certain period of time, I then give them all the solutions uh, to the problems and release it at that point. Again, there are different approaches that you can do off of that. This is the one that I do. Um, algorithmic. So web work and my open math, uh, and to a very, very, very small degree, H5P. Um, and native gives you the ability to do some sort of algorithmic capabilities. That's the true power of web work in my open mouth. So you can come in and you can make it if you're talking about STEM or math based, well, STEM or math, but STEM based questions, you can make it so that every student gets a different version of that question. For example, if you're doing sciences and you're saying how many grams or how many moles of this and how many grams of that, you can then vary how many grams you have to begin with across the board so every student gets a different number and that means every calculation is going to be different and that's algorithmic uh, and is, you have to wire the program up appropriately to handle that because it's not some, it's not checking for a number it's checking for a calculation and then getting the number but that's exceedingly powerful and this is basically saying that you will turn it on so that things could be algorithmic if they are algorithmic you can then decide the late policy do you want to accept late um, do you, if you accept late, do you want to just accept it and mark it late and you decide what you want to do? Or do you want to accept it late and give deductions? And this introduces a new set of uh, logic. Do you want to have a deduction per, uh, uh, per late? Like let's say uh, late deduction percent is 10%. Uh, and then you can say the deduction is every 24 hours that they are late. Uh, um, <clears throat> And that's just one mode in order to be able to do that. You can decide if you want uh, this assignment to be part of their grading or outside of their grading. That's part of, when I mean grading, I mean of the overall score in the class, because we have the grade book gives you a calculation of that, just like it would be in your learning management system. In fact, I don't use my learning management system grade book. I use it uh, ADAPT for doing it because it gives me more power than what Canvas allows me to do. I can give instructions to the students in order to say, do this by this, remember to do this, et cetera, um, that's out there. I have the ability in order to provide uh, randomization. So I can make an assignment that consists of 30 problems and then let a randomized pool, it's a pool, let each student gets three questions or n number of questions uh, out of that pool and it's randomly selected. So I do this for pre-labs, for example, in order to make sure that they have read problems, read the pre-lab, and there are 20 or 30 different problem, 30 simple problems that if they read it, they would have gotten it. Uh, and then they each have a random number, so they can't one read it and say, this is what you need to do and have it distributed. I can have notifications, which basically means that uh, if I click this on, that students will be notified via email that the assignment is due. Now, the students get to decide at what time they want the email. Do they want it one hour before it's due, 24 hours, 36 hours, 12? It's up to them to decide how they want uh, the emails to be sent. But we're basically saying that this is uh, uh, subject to notifications. Some assignments, we don't want notifications. They're not necessary in order to, uh, 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 to send email out, out to remind them. This is the near the end of this uh, big overview of making assignments is that you have the ability in order to uh, assign everyone in the class to have the same parameters. Uh, 
However, you may have students that require special accommodations. So you can select a specific student that's registered. And when we have registered students, you have the whole roster right here. And you can say, this: all students in the class, it's open at this time, it's closed at this time, um, and this is a final submission. This is connected to the late field. And I can say this student right here is separate, needs 50% more time. And I can say, okay, well, I'm going to give this to uh, PM. Uh, and now they have 50% more time. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so you can, this is useful when you have lots of students in order to organize that they have different times and dates to it. It's also important when we have... Uh, sections. Uh, like I said, I have 16 sections for my big general chemistry class. Each section has different dates and times when their labs are due and uh, and other things because they're in different sections and they do them at different times. Uh, the final submission deadline is that is the deadline connected to um, uh, the fact that I have a late submission is that I may not want them to be able to submit, uh, let's say your 10 percent deducted every 24 hours. So that would mean that they would be able to submit up to 10 days after the deadline. If I want to make it and say, well, I want you to submit your homework uh, by five days after the deadline, uh, because I need to actually calculate your grade or something like that. So you just can't have it go off. You want to have a hard cut and say, this is the end, uh, game over. You don't just keep it extended all the way to the end. Uh, and that right there, I'm just going to... October, this needs to be, actually, this is fine, whatever. And then I, I save it. Late, de uh, late deduction must be an integer. Get rid of the percent. And now I've created my first assignment. Now, was that painful? Yeah. Now, lots of details associated with making an assignment. So how do we simplify that? Well, we have the ability uh, to save this, all these parameters, let's say I use these parameters for every assignment because it's my philosophy, it's my pedagogy and how I do it. I could save that as a, uh, as a template. Um, and I wanna see that this should be, uh, I'm gonna check to see if you can pull up an existing uh, assignment in order to make the template. And you create the template that using that same rubric and once you do that, when you create an assignment, you can say, use that template. So you don't have to recreate that over and over again. And you can decide on how you want to go about doing that. Uh, and I, I'm going to modify that uh, a bit. Anyways, back to my assignments. Okay. So are we cool so far? I can certainly duplicate the assignment if I want. And now I've created the assignment. Again, uh, I would have to change the dates probably uh, in order to make it applicable, but it's one convenient way in order to be able to make this uh, make this out here. And you can then modify this and save it. And there you go. So where are we? We've made a course. In the course, we made assignments. We went through a lot of protocol in order to be able to make the assignments the way that we want, uh, want it to be used. Um, now, what's it look like here? Well, uh, this right here looks very similar to that course structure, which before just has an on and off button. But inside here, we have more complexity. We have multiple assignments. It tells you what group it's connected to, when it's open and when it's closed. It tells you the status of it, saying that, yes, this is open and yes, this is open. Which means that if you have a student enrolled in this class, these assignments, they're ready to rock. They can start doing them right now. You can naturally turn off that assignment so students never will see that that assignment exists. So you can build a whole lot of your class, but students only see certain things when you decide you want them to see it. Um, and then you have these actions, which look very similar to the actions we did before. The one thing that's unique is this check mark, and that check mark is the grader. And that's the grader that you use for auto grading in order to be an efficient mechanism in order to grade questions uh, across the board. And I'll show that to you. It's best to show it to you in a class that has submissions and things rather than in a new class here. There's this one thing here that's a little unique called main view. If you flip this main view, which is a toggle, it gives you all these toggles associated with your assignment. 
Uh, keep in mind, the point here is to give you power in order to decide how you want to use your assignments. Uh, and there are different things that you want to release on your assignments to your students, or you may want to do it. For example, you may not want the students to see the scores in the class in, in, for their submission. That's, for example, if you have open-ended assignments, like what Veronica was talking about, uh, you want to release them all at once, not at the point where you actually grade as you move along. Uh, you may want to release solutions or you may not want to release solutions depending upon what your pedagogy is. You decide when you want to do it. When you press the switch, now you release the solutions. Uh, there are different types of solutions, which I'll talk about in a moment. You can release the statistics or not. You may want the students to see what the distribution is and the standard deviation and the mean is. You may not want them to do that. It's up to you. You may want to do the points per breakdown. So you may want to let students to know even before uh, they've submitted it, how the breakdown is of the assignment. That's useful more for exams if you don't want students to know exactly how the exam is, uh, is organized. Now, I tend to do that. I tend to show people, uh, students, what the exam is and how the scores are, but you may not want them to know that there are four questions uh, for their quiz uh, in one way or another. Lastly is the student names. And the student names, if you flip the switch, means that when you grade it uh, and you, you look at it, you don't see the names of the students. So it's like a blindfold off of that. Why do you want to do that? Well, now you have no bias across the board as a grader. We will flip the switch in order to make this as an instructor. So you can make it so the instructors never know who the students are unless they need to flip a switch in order to see who they are. So you can completely grade it as anonymously as you as possible without having it, to have any issues associated with favoritism uh, or reverse favoritism or claims of uh, racism and sexism and all the things like that in terms of grading that you can say, look, you just don't know who they are. I have this sort of issue with TAs when they grade, because TAs uh, typically tend to grade their own students better than they do other students, at least when we look at the statistics. And this that provides a mechanism that when I have students that are grading an exam, you know, 300 exams, um, it's as biased, uh, unbiased across the board uh, in evaluating the questions that they are doing. So, okay, we'll flip over to that. Are we cool so far? Any issues or questions regarding this? Is it complex? Yes, I understand. But if you want to use this in a variety of different ways, uh, you need to have some level of complexity. But you're probably already familiar with this sort of complexity with learning management systems because they do the same thing in their courses and their, their assignments. So now comes into adding questions. Now, there are a few details associated with uh, assignments uh, uh, in terms of how people are, are using this. Um, uh, one is a summary. That's just basically an overview that gives you an idea about what's the detail associated with that assignment. Uh, one of the properties that we already went over is a control panel, which gives you that, uh, that targets like I showed before on the front end. Submission overrides gives you abilities in order to override deadlines. Uh, but the one thing that I want to talk about are grade books. Canvas has a, a grade book Canvas has a limited gradebook. So what does a gradebook, what's the data look like for um, a gradebook? Well, it's really a cube. So what you have is you have students on one dimension, you have assignments on another dimension, and you have scores. But the assignments are really questions. So that describes the performance on one assignment. And the next assignment then has a different set of scores. And the next assignment has a different set of scores. So this becomes a cube of data. But that's not what Canvas or other learning management systems show you, especially with Canvas. I, I'm less familiar with other LMSs, to be honest. Um, what they show you is just basically what's the score per assignment, not what's the score per question, because it's complex for that. What we do is that we have an assignment gradebook that tells you the breakdown of the questions and a course gradebook, which tells you the breakdown on the assignment scores. So when a student needs a change on a score on a specific question, you can go into that question and flip a switch 
and then everything is automatically registered. In Canvas, you have to go in and say, okay, the assignment was 37. I gave them two extra points for this question. I'm going to add it into it. This provides a better mechanism in order to be able to do the learning analytics using the sort of analytics that I showed you, that dashboard yesterday. And I could show this to you, and I should show this to you. Uh, let me let me go into my dashboard. I'm going to go into, let's say, general chemistry honors class. I'm going to go into my course gradebook. Uh, so this is FERPA protected, so these are not real names. Uh, or real email addresses, so they're meant for me to present it. Um, so this is not the best way in order to do that. That's looking at the grade book. Um, I can look at this homework assignment, and I can look at the uh, the assignment grade book, which gives me um, gives me the question numbers and the the student names and how they're connected. Or I can look at the grade great uh, the course grade book, which gives me the names and the assignments that are in there. So again, what is a matrix gives you slices through it, and then you're able to manipulate it effectively. And then you can do proper analytics on it effectively, because you're looking at it at the question level. Um, that's there. Uh, so that's just a little bit of a complexity. Let me switch back to Meredith's. And Meredith, I will wipe this clean so you don't need to uh, worry about this. Uh, worry about me using your account for doing this thing. Okay. So the rest of this topic uh, of this workshop is basically dealing with questions, um, the, the nitty gritty detail uh, uh, of uh, any homework system. So we have lots of questions. Now questions are typically, or the way we deal with questions are in two different ways. One is either we're interested in using existing questions or two, we're interested in building new questions. So let's just talk about the first one and then we'll transition to the second one uh, near the end. So we wanna use, add existing questions to this assignment that we put into assignment assi two, not a very unique name, but still there. And I wanna add assignments. Well, I can add assignments right here. Now, before I do that, I just wanna go back into this dashboard. I didn't actually mention this dashboard to begin with, but I should now. Under the dashboard, and you guys don't see control panel, only I see that right now. So dashboard gives you this set of eight links. One goes to my courses, which is exactly what we showed before. And I'll just do that right now. So here are my courses that I've created. One goes to my questions. Now, the one thing about questions to think about, think about to understand, is that every question needs an owner someone has to own a question. Now, whether that owner is the LibreText default system or it's you, because you've added it, it needs to have an owner. And the owner is the one that actually holds it in what they call their my question area. So when I collect on my question area for Meredith, it consists of nothing because it's a new account. So there's nothing in here. But if I were to switch over to myself, and I really should just um, do this. It's just better to, uh, instead of switching over, switching to different browsers. So if I go to my questions under my account, I now have loads and loads of questions. They're organized as folders on the left-hand side. And inside each folder then has a series of uh, questions that are there. Because they're my questions, I can then come in and edit them. I have this little pencil in order to say, here's question 10.3. Uh, uh, and this is what a standard question looks like, which has some metadata to describe you know, who owns it, who's the author of it, which may not be the owner. Um, it, this was created in Boston, what the license is of that, uh, that question, uh, source, uh, learning outcome, if you want to tag it to a specific uh, learning outcome. Uh, it's an open-ended question, which means it's just text. Uh, it's not auto-graded. Uh, and then I have a, a, a set of a solutions for that. So this right here is all math jacks, LaTeX. 
that if I were to render this, I can then view the question right here, or I can view the solution right here for that. And that's what's released. So that's an open-ended question that that's there. But while I have this thing open, I'll show the, the structure. Uh, uh, any question in ADAPT has a four uh, block or big block, super block structure. One is meta tags, one is content, one is accessibility alternatives, and the other one is supplemental content. And just to give you the structure over here, these things are pretty straightforward following the definitions we did before. Exposition, we're going to skip over that. That's part of learning trees. Content. Content is uh, what the students see. So when they actually preview a question, you see the, the, what's in the content. But you'll notice that there are two entries to the content. There's open-ended content and auto-graded content. I have the ability in order to uh, either write text down, and that will be the question, or I can delete the question, delete this thing, and I can submit an auto-grade question, either an existing auto-grade question from my repository of WebWork, H5P, and IMATH AS, which is a microservice on our system, or new versions of those codes. So for example, web work, I could select web work. And if I use a template like a reaction, it throws in what's called web work code. Now, if you're not happy with H5P, sorry, HTML, you're not going to be happy with Perl, which is the language that this thing runs. Now, don't worry about that. You're not, unless you're going to be doing STEM fields, you're probably not going to be doing web work. But now I've just used and swapped this with auto graded technology that's right down here telling you how to write down this text-based thing. But while I'm here, I can actually do both. I can have open-ended questions up here, and I can have auto-graded questions down here. Now, many of you are wondering, why would I want to do that? This block up here, is an HTML block. So while I can paste this into the auto grade, I can embed other things. For example, if you're familiar with FET simulations, it's a graphical description in order to be able to play around with molecules and things like that, or not molecules, but experiments. You can embed a, a JavaScript thing on here that's not designed as an auto grade technology and then connect an auto grade technology below it. So now you've taken all of FET simulations and now you can make them into interactive questions or any other questions that are out there. If you're unfamiliar with FET, then it's hard for me to actually see if, if you guys understand what I'm talking about since <coughs> I can only see a few of you. Um, so let's say I take a question like here's a FET simulation and I say, I want, um, I want this simulation. I can tell the students, uh, in this simulation here, uh, and I have some question, for neon, what is the interaction strength of neon-neon interactions? They have to interact with it at the top, and then they have to submit the answer down below. We call those things Frankensteins. They should be called Frankenstein's monsters, but let's not do that. Basically, what I'm saying is I have the ability in order to make it on here, uh, pit fet in here, and then have the question down below, and it's all tied together. And I can do this without having to worry about whether FET technology enables auto grading capabilities. So you can really do a lot of very powerful things with Frankenstein's. Uh, we have now accessibility alternatives. In, if we are following universal design, everything that we do will be good for accessibility purposes. However, a lot of technologies are not like that. For example, I'm not entirely sure FET simulations are accessible. Um, so we need to have an alternative to students if the primary content is not accessible. And that's what we have with ADAPT. And we're very excited in order to be able to implement this technology. So if a student requires a different version of their question that's accessible, we can do that. Like for example, this question right here is auto graded question. This is, uh, let's say that this question, right, this auto graded technology is not very good for accessibility purposes. That's like uh, many uh, H5P questions in the studio, which I didn't, I probably don't have time in order to get to. 
nothing says, for example, if you have a drag and drop, you grab something and you move it into a different spot. That's really great if you have well-functioning eyes. But if you uh, are visually impaired, there's no solution to drag and drop. It's just not an accessible uh, alternative. But what you can do is you can convert that drag and drop into text, and you can provide them with the text-based alternative. Or if you can convert that autograde, that inconsistent, non-compliant technology into a series of autograde technologies that may be a little clunky. For example, you could typically make most questions into multiple choice questions. It may be very clunky, very annoying to deal with, uh, and not nearly as beautiful as uh, drag and drop, but it will be a viable alternative for students that require that accessibility component. So the key point here is universal design means that you want to make everything universal. This is basically saying, look, you could still do stuff that's not universal, that's still not really accessible, as long as you have an alternative that is accessible. And ADAPT is designed in order to be able to implement that effectively. Uh, and we're very excited about that. So now you can use lots of technologies so that 99.9% .9 of the students that can use those technologies well can do so. The students that can't use those technologies, you have the ancillary, the uh, alternative in order to be able to address them properly. Um, Meredith asked a question, how does a student get the accessible alternative? Uh, you basically have to flip a switch for that specific student. So a student has a designated uh, that they require that accessibility. Uh, we have talked about the prospect of having students decide that they uh, des they want it uh, on their own. And my accessibility team wants us to be able to, to wire that up, but we haven't done that um, yet. Deborah asked a question about if we're gonna be replacing Canvas. Canvas is far more than homework system. Uh, and we wanna have a very targeted approach for ADAPT for doing that. We have something that we call uh, Solo, which is a mini LMS, but that's, we just don't have time to talk about that. Um, then, the, then there come the supplementary content, the answers, which are meant to be a, the answer, the solution, which is meant to be a worked out tutorial for students to actually learn about uh, these things. We have hints and we have notes and notes are just like what we had before. You can write them down uh, and they are personal uh, uh, discussion annotations on how to use that question effectively. I'm going to cancel that um, because I did not want to destroy it. Uh, and such. So you can see we're working on a variety of different fields of chemistry that's out there. Okay, so that's a general lowdown of, of, a, of a question. Um, so let's get back into adding questions to here. So when I'm emphasizing that questions have to be owned by somebody, that means that you have to be able to find the questions. Uh, and naturally the owner has the question then you have the ability to search through them and find them. If the course is public, you can browse through the course and find it yourself, but you need to find the question. So let's go into these things. Um, actually, there are a few other ones here about learning trees, which I wanna skip over, or templates I already talked about. If you go to public courses or commons, these are both courses that, are, that you can parse through in order to find uh, what other people have done. The public, courses are again any course that anyone has made public across the board that you can take a look and see what how did Bob Belford at the University of Arkansas Little Rock uh, how did he organize his um, his courses <coughs> and his questions off of here um, the commons is also a public uh, repository of content but these are uh, question these are courses that uh, the Libra text is curating themselves for example, here are the OpenStax questions. We have 1,700 OpenStax questions. We took them, converted them, auto-graded, build proper solutions because most of them have mediocre to no real solutions that we like, then convert them into, uh, into algorithmic uh, and then uh, made it available. So you can come in and you can just peruse and say, okay, well, uh, I wanna look through this section right here. And then you're parsing through it. And you're seeing it right now in anonymous view, which means that you're not able to see the solutions uh, there, um, but you're able to say, well, I like this question and you can go with it. Anyways, that's browsing. Find an existing repository, an existing course, and you're looking through it and you, you say, okay, I found it. 
Now, what exactly do you want to do with these things? Well, if you're browsing through here, you have the ability to just add to your favorites. That's the equivalent of your uh, book uh, 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 bookmarks on your browser. So you add to your favorites and it saves this thing to your favorites. Uh, uh, you go here and you say, I like this, this is my favorites. Uh, and this is my favorites. And now if I were to go to my favorites, I actually technically Meredith's favorites, I'm gonna go to my questions and I look to my favorites, I can then see that didn't show up. Okay, I need to find out why that didn't show up. Uh, if I go to my favorites here, you can see that I have uh, favoritized um, uh, three questions. Uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, which is right here, and I, I liked it and such. So anyways, that's a way in which you can peru uh, 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 peruse and, and like, take a look at these things. What is more powerful or equally as powerful is being able to do a search through all questions. And you can search through all questions when you add uh, assignments. Oh, thank you, uh, Millie. Um, let me go to my questions here. It's the same interface, but it's, it's a little bit more convenient. So you can go through, sorry, let me go to all questions. So all questions is a search infrastructure to the entire repository of content. So we have 113,322 questions right now that you can parse through, public questions. So even if you don't like our technology, even if you don't like any of your technology or anything like that, this provides a massive question bank for you to be able to parse through. I don't know any faculty member, member that doesn't want to have access to a massive question bank. So, um, and Lorraine, yes, you can make your own questions, uh, which I will show very quickly at the end. Um, so this right here gives me access to all these questions, uh, starting from ID number one and going to ID uh, 113, 322. Uh, gives me the title, gives me the author, gives me the technology, and gives me the meta tags that are connected to it. And it has a little heart to tell me if I actually have a uh, um, favorite favorite so I can favor that question and now I select I want that to be in my okay I don't want to make a new a new folder I'm just going to make it there and now it has a little red mark which means that I have I like I love this this thing and I'm going to unmark it because I don't teach Spanish so anyways um so what do we have well you could do searches through here because it's you're not going to be able to look through this entire repository. You can look at only uh, auto grade questions. And do a refresh. So now we're down to 95,790. And the vast majority of these questions come from the repositories of MyOpenMath, of, of IMath AS, and WebWork. But many of them also come from other repositories, um, like uh, native uh, native stuff that we got from um, um, from Canvas Commons. Okay, I can also do a selection on a specific type of technology that I like. So let's say I only want to use H5P. Why do I want to do that? I don't know. So I can do a search, and I can say only H5P. I have nine thousand six hundred and twenty six questions of only H5P. Uh, and then every question on this list will be H5P right here. I can then do more targeted structure. Let's say I want to go back to any technology. I'm going to keep it all in. And I just do a search for limits. So uh, do a search on limits. And now it comes up with 1,012 questions that have term limits in the title. Um, and then I can say, okay, well, this is a web work question, but if I were to go to one of these other ones, this is an IMath AS question, a MyOpenMath question. I can click on it and say, okay, do I like this? This is what it looks like. This is an open-ended question that really should be open-ended, not IMath AS, but it comes in with a repository that's there. Um, here now we have a more auto grade question dealing with limits. So this is a way you can parse through here. Um, based off of here. And if I like this, 
I can like it. And now it's stored in my favorites and then I can add them. If I want to put limits in meta tags instead of titles, I can do that. It comes up with less numbers uh, because not everything is super tagged up well, especially from the content that we brought in from my open math and web work. Uh, but now comes in with these questions and asks uh, are limits in the meta tag somewhere? Actually, I don't see them. I don't see limit. Oh, here. I don't see limits actually written down here, but they're must be grabbing it from the title. So you can come in and say, okay, do I like this one? Well, this is web work. Uh, and I like this question. So you can like it. As we make the alignments better, uh, meta tagging better, start to align these things to learning objectives, centralized framework, it becomes more and more powerful. But it's going to take a little bit of time for us to curate this massive repository that we're building and that we've uh, inherited from other sources. You can then do a search and say, I only want to look from a specific author like Moon. And now I see uh, 526 questions that are probably all Christina Moon, Spanish uh, as a foreign language. And I can go through and find her specific questions that are there. We'll probably have another one that will be campus in order to be able to do a search here. The key point is that this is a interface in order to access this massive database that we have. Now, why is this important? How do you actually use this for adding questions, which is where we were getting to? I'm going to go to question 101. Um, Veronica, hold on one second. Let me do this and then I'll get to it. I add assessments and then I can choose where I want to get my source. So I can either get my questions from my personal question bank that I've created, get back into Lorraine's question. I can look at the ones that I have favored. I can look at all all my courses, if I want to find questions on a different part of my courses, courses that are in the comments or courses in the public uh, thing. If I just want to go through all questions, that has the same interface that I just showed you before. So it can come in and it can say, do me a, do a search through Moon. It comes within the same sort of questions. And now I have this little plus mark. Well, the plus mark adds them to your assignment. I like this one, this one, this one, and this one. And now I've added those four into my assignment. Let's say I want to see these, these four to evaluate them. I can highlight them here. And I can view them right here. And I can see, okay, oh, I like that one. I like that one. I don't like that one. Of course, I can't read any of them, but that doesn't matter. Um, and there you go. Uh, so if I were to, I've added these three, these four. So now you can see that they are red here. Uh, and if I go back up to my assignment, I can see that I've added all four here and they're ready to rock. So if the assignment is open for the students, as soon as I add them to them, the students can start submitting. If the assignment hasn't been open, I add to them. It doesn't really matter. They don't, they don't see it. Um, you can come in and, and, um, uh, and copy them and delete them. You can reorder them if you want. Students don't see the title of the question. So that can be anything they they are. It doesn't really matter. It gives you some information, hopefully. Sometimes it doesn't. The students don't see it, so you don't need to worry about it. This is just meant for you. I will mention the ID number here. Every question has an ID. The first number is the assignment ID. The second number is the question ID. So this is question one in 9059 uh, assignment. I can use question one in a different assignment, which would have a different assignment ID number um, conveniently. If I want, um, and that's useful because when I want to embed these questions into a LibreText page, I need this number. That's why it has this little copy right here that's there. Um, and I could show you that but I don't have a great deal of time. So I'm going to skip over that component off of here. So that right there is adding them. I will mention something quickly. If you're using a question multiple times on a course, when you try to add them, these things will turn red in order to tell you are to use that question. And that's convenient. So you don't actually rep, you know, ask the same question, or at least you know that you've already asked that question and that you decide if you want to ask that question again. 
you know, or you just accidentally gave that question in multiple assignments and that's it. And I've done that numerous times um, and, and such. So um, I'll talk about making, uh, making a question simply. It's relatively straightforward, uh, but let me just answer a few questions right here if I may. Okay, Veronica, you don't see a search. You want to do a search for a specific topic. Uh, do you still not see a search? I, I just used title. It worked. Uh, oh, this you don't see update results? No, I I was looking for the actual word search, but oh, when I yeah. put in and, and we don't gender have the under title. Yeah, we don't have the, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it, right now, it's all questions uh, uh, that you then do a search through. Uh, I'm thinking, and I've been thinking a, a while in order to make, make it, call it search, <laughs> which is a better term for doing it. Uh, but my programmer is resistant to that. So I need to actually uh, uh, come to that. Uh, but uh, uh, are you able to uh, to do a search properly through the all questions area? I did and found 46 questions. Perfect. There you go. Good. And naturally, as this gets bigger, it gets more powerful for everybody. OK. Um, uh, Charity, is there a way to export question banks uh, created by faculty from DD2? Yes. Uh, in fact, when you go to my questions, you have bulk import, uh, and then you can import a, um, uh, a zip export file from Canvas directly into here. Now, I will mention uh, the I and QTI question and test interoperability suggests that things are interoperable. Um, that is a misnomer for QTI. Uh, uh, so, uh, for example, Canvas has a, a version of QTI, I think it's like 1.2 which is an old version that doesn't jive with other versions that, that come in and different things like that. So what we do know is that these questions right here, we fine tune and we bring in. If you have other types of questions, we will build the interface in order to make them and use them productively. Uh, it, it just will take a little bit of time in order to do so. Uh, but the intent is for us to go through Compass Com Canvas Commons and get as many of the OER question banks possible integrated so that everybody has access to in order to be able to use it. Um, D2L, I know very little about D2L uh, and, and that might be a good thing, but uh, uh, I just need to, uh, if, you, if you export them, we could take a look and see what version D2L uses and then how to do it. Moodle has Q, uh, D2, has QTI, but they also have this thing called GIFT which they're the only ones that I know that uses this gift uh, uh, template uh, and is not very interoperable. Uh, so we haven't really dealt with Moodle uh, integration, but then the key point is that you can come in and you can and you can uh, work this up and everyone can benefit. We will have an export option, so you can actually export these things, but the, the issue is exporting them to what format uh, because these things are not designed to work well with each other. Web work won't work with IMAP AS. One's PHP, one's Perl programming. Uh, uh, QTI doesn't work with any of the other ones. So that's why we built this super system that wraps everything around it so you can use them all and you don't need to worry about one versus the other. Andy asks, if you're editing, the original doesn't automatically, ah, that's a really good question. Hold on one moment for that. Never mind, I just tried, I'm not, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, there are three big things that we have planned for ADAPT before the end of the year. One is to build a role system. So we have the ability in order to assign multiple people to an instructor or a class um, so you can actually work a little bit more effectively than what we have. One is to build a better aligner for frameworks so that we can actually make it so that you can pull up a framework of learning objectives for an assignment, uh, for a question, and you can press the button that's applicable and then just rapidly align to that framework. Because we want to be able to put everything together within a centralized framework so you can evaluate proficiencies in subject matters or, or learning objectives slows for a course as you go. The third one, is a draft infrastructure, very similar to the drafts that we have for, or revisions that we have for our books. So that when you use a question, it will give you, you will be using that version of a question at the time that you bring it in. So if the author comes in and modifies that question, it doesn't interfere with your course. Why would you wanna do that? 
Well, let's say you create an exam of questions and you don't want your the original author that modified to modify that question right before your exam starts. So you need to have some level of control so that when someone modif the original author, the owner modifies a question, it doesn't interfere with the way you're using that question. You'll get the option to update that question if you decide that you want to do it because it's a version level off of it. And that right there is desired in order to make it so you can go about doing these things. I will mention that you have the ability to make a duplicate of any question. So even if you can't own it, uh, uh, like what Andy is mentioning, that you don't have editing rights to it, you could then duplicate it and then you make a version that in, in your course, in your my my question area, that you can then edit as you want. Naturally, if you don't want to edit it, then there's no reason for duplicating it. Uh, so you have control in order to be able to do that. And there's going to be a lot more power in the way that we're going to build this thing up so it's robust. Uh, it doesn't get in people's ways, but you can still be able to uh, advance and move things forward uh, effectively. Okay. So let's talk about creating problems. Uh, and I just have a few minutes left and I know that we're at time, but I do want to emphasize these things. Uh, I showed you what a problem looks like when I pulled it up, these four super blocks. Okay, those That same modal is exactly how you make a new problem. So you go to my questions and you have right here on the left-hand side, new questions. You press on it and it's that same modal. The same, actually, in this case here is a box. And this is how you create a new problem. When you create the problem, it will be saved in your uh, my, my problems thing. So I can say this is problem one. I'm making this an assessment problem. So again, exposition is part of learning trees. I'm going to make this not public. So I don't want anyone to be able to do a search and find this problem. My prerogative. Um, I can decide where I want to keep it because it's stored in my favorites. I may want to, sorry, it's stored in my, my questions area. I want to have that structured in a way that I can go back and find that problem, not just one big mess. So I'm just going to keep it in, in main. I can then decide who the author is. The author is Meredith because I'm logged in as her. I have to decide what license is there. It won't let me save unless I decide what license is involved in it. And that's meant in order to mandate that the integrity of the system is compliant with OER. So I'm going to say this is CC by NC. I can decide what version type is. And technically, I need to give a source. If I'm making this myself, I just source uh, adapt. I can provide meta tags, which is useful for searching, uh, like cats. I can provide a search, like let's say this is pre-calculus, and I want it to be that learning objective and that learning objective. Now comes the detail, these three blocks here. The only thing that you that you definitely need is something in the content block. Everything else is optional. So if I want to make an open-ended question, I can pop in here. What is the color? What is in my pocket? So there's the question. If I preview it, it's not a very impressive question, but that's a question. It's open-ended, which requires manual review, which is a checker process that fortunately I didn't get to, uh, but uh, you can check it. You see that little check mark and do it. I can convert it to auto grade technology. If I want to switch to web work, uh, I can then say, here's a template and I can edit it. If you don't want to do that because this scares you, that's perfectly fine. You could switch to H5P. Then it goes to the studio, which when you're logged in, you can then create an H5P problem and it will come back and you're able to interface to it. Um, I'm going to do that with none. I can then do the accessibility alternatives, which are very similar to this content block. I could put the answer. My precious is the answer. Uh, and I could put the solution, you know, one ring to rule them all. Uh, and go into great exposition about Sauron and uh, et cetera. The key point is the solution should be a tutorial that people can, students can learn from. And that unfortunately is rarity in 
questions out there. So we go through a lot of effort to try to build these solutions. And we use students primarily in order to do that. And then we refine them with subject matter experts. And then I save it. Okay. And now it's created it. I can go into my questions and I can see it right here. And anytime I want to, I can then edit it and then update these things. Um, let's say what is in my green pocket. And now I've updated it. And anyone can use that question, but if they can find that question, uh, uh, if you made it public, you can search through it. Here's the question ID number uh, that they can then go for. Uh, and you can use that in a variety of different places. That there. So that's a simplified way in order to create questions. If you do have uh, existing questions in your learning management system, you can import them. We have several types of uh, templates for doing that. And if those don't work, then contact us and we can manually take a look at it in order to bring them in. Uh, there are a few other things that are useful and powerful here, but I just don't have the time in order to go to because unfortunately an hour plus, hour and a half was not enough in order to do ADAPT. Normally this is a one day uh, workshop for just the ADAPT component itself. This should hopefully get you going in order to be able to address uh, a, a few things. Uh, if you since many of you are interested in open-ended questions, I will just show you the auto grader for one of my classes, and then I can end this thing out. So let's deal with, uh, this is my, my question. So let's go to uh, midterm one. So this is my midterm that I gave to the students. Uh, and some of the questions you see are plain text, which means they're open-ended. Some are files, which they had to upload. Uh, so I wanted to do their work. If I go in and do, where are we? I, if I do this checker right here, it pulls up this grader system. Um, let me turn FERPA on so these are not real names. Uh, and you could do a search to say, okay, I want to look at question one. And then I can start to go through uh, and look at each of the question and see what's happening. So question one tends to be all, I'm looking for, These are all auto grade questions for some reason or another. These are, this is not, not the right uh, thing. Um, Show discussion. I want to see those discussions. Yeah, well. Show discussion. I'm not sure what that's reference. Let me, let me show you this thing. On, on the previous page. Okay. I so this is, the, this is the same thing. So uh, uh, there's no. There's no open ended. Um, I'm these should be open ended. So these are performances. Okay, so uh, I'm not doing a good job finding the right example here, and I apologize for that. But uh, it, the the students submit the scores here. That I can come in as a grader, and I can write down a discussion here, um, and then if they submit a, a file, I can see the file down below. And I could basically cut through and go uh, student by student for the question, uh, and I can grade them very efficiently. This was tuned by my TAs that didn't want to, to spend a single moment more than what they needed to in order to be able to grade the students uh, and made this efficient uh, in order to be able to select this, this, the question and then just go through. So I can basically have these students grading uh, 150 uh, or 300 exams, they can say, okay, you do one, you do three, you do seven, and they can do it all simultaneously in parallel in order to be able to do that. Students can submit audio, and then you can actually do feedback in audio, if that's the preferred way in which you want to do it, especially for foreign languages uh, or for music. Uh, you can also do canned responses. So you can say, well, he's, these are the five questions, uh, responses that people tend, students tend to do wrong. And I just don't want to rewrite the same question over and over again. I just click on the canned response and just basically pops them down there, ready, ready to rock. My TAs love this, um, especially I mean, it, it's, it works better than uh, Canvas. I think it's comparable to GradeScope uh, in the way it operates um, and such. So anyways, I am five minutes, seven minutes over time. Yeah, your time is uh, important, so I don't want to extend uh, this. Um, I will end this right now uh, with the, the words that the Libreverse, hopefully uh, you come to the conclusion 
uh, that at least we have that uh, the Libreverse is an exceedingly powerful uh, infrastructure uh, uh, in order to advance OER. Uh, we think it's the most powerful collection of resources available in order to be able to promote uh, OER in general, uh, and you have access to it um, basically for free here. So feel free to take advantage of it, ask any questions that you have. Um, we have office hours Tuesday and Thursdays from 9 to 10 o'clock Pacific time. Um, we also have the chat, the Discord channel that's, uh, I, I pasted those links into the forum, uh, and uh, we will be advancing uh, quite uh, rapidly in a variety of different uh, ways. Since you guys signed up for the uh, commons, you'll get an email every couple of months in terms of progress that we are doing. Uh, and thank you again for attending. Uh, and for those of you that uh, uh, that we'll be getting swag. Uh, we will be printing up the swag, uh, printing up the shirts and things uh, in, later on this week in order to be able to get things going. And you'll get that in addition to uh, special metallic stickers that Jennifer is really quite proud of. Yeah, I'm not sure if she's still here. She is. Okay. Um, and, and so you get Can some... I just add, Delmar, people, uh, if the uh, people who registered and are uh, entitled to swag with registration can please send me your best mailing address. That would be wonderful. So thank you again. Um, and um, there was one question. You access office hours actually uh, via uh, officehours.libretext.org. Uh, it's actually also zoom.libretext.org goes to it. Uh, and it's it's actually what we're in right now. It's the private room for our Zoom account um, that that's there. Um, and if I'm not there, uh, someone else is there in order to be able to help. But I tend to be there about 95% of the time. So again, thank you very much. Uh,